for that that is to describe the wave function we may start with two different countries united states and germany okay now not that here we are with two astounding scientists from two different countries and, and two different timelines also carl frederick gosh and john clark slater or more precisely what we are going to talk about here are the orbitals resulting from their equations commonly known as Gaussian type orbitals or GTO and Slater type orbitals or STO. GTOs vary as e to the power minus alpha r square whereas the dependence of STOs vary as the exponential of negative alpha r. Of course alpha is just the exponent right which can take different values. Uh, now let's take a look at the 1s orbital of the hydrogen atom. It has the form as psi 1s equal to pi by root 2, 2 exponential of minus r by a0 where this a0 is the bow radius and has the value of 0 0.5 to 9 into 10 to the power minus 10 meter of course every one of you know that right. However clearly it's a slater type orbital right and not Gaussian and but one is is trivial now take a look at these wave functions it's right that all these have the form of exponential of minus alpha r but there are other dependencies on r too in fact if you look at these plots that's the plot of the orbitals radial nodes can be seen in some orbitals which cannot be reproduced by one slater type orbital therefore the message is that the STOs are not perfect either. That's okay. But remember that always Slater type orbitals have the correct functional behavior near the nucleus. That is a cusp and a decay in the correct way at long distances. Gaussian type orbitals provide a relatively poor description of the atomic orbitals. They have a finite value at the nucleus and decay too quickly and thus it underestimates long-range interactions. However, though there are some deficiencies, in both cases there is actually no loss in desired accuracy as long as enough of these new functions are used such that there is an adequate description of the final molecular orbitals. So both the STOs and the GTOs stand on and somewhat equal footing now. So yes, up to now, STU is silently getting a little advantage over the other one. Now, one thing is there, remember, we may use one or the other of these functions as the basis functions, but we never ever will mix basis function types. I hope up to that part, everything has been clear to you. Now, we need to check one other important property too of these basis functions. See, what you are going to do you are going to do it in your computer right so we need to check how much these functions cooperate computationally for that we are going to need the works of a famous physicist you may recall that our very first talk of this particular series started with walter Cohn, right the father of dft however today we are not going to talk about him but the one with whom his nobel prize was shared Sir John Anthony Pope. Another two physicists who also did pioneering work with Sir Pope in this particular field are Warren J. Heere and Robert A. Stewart. In their 1969 paper titled Self Consistent Molecular Orbital Methods Use of Gaussian Expansions of Slater Type Atomic Orbitals, they have shown that the Slater Type Orbitals can be represented as a sum of Gaussian type orbitals and the efficiency of such representations are very high than actual Slater type orbitals. You may take a look into this paper, I am putting the link in the description box. However, let me explain one important aspect of this. See, while doing TFT calculations, often we are going to encounter these type of integrals. Here, f1, f2, f3 and f4 are the functions for the basis sets. This particular integral is called a four center integral. Now, the product of any two Gaussians is just another Gaussian, 
and the sum of two Gaussians is easily evaluated. Thus, this particular integral easily reduces to a two center integral when we use Gaussians. But this is not the case for STOs. The product of two STOs is not just another STO. But the complication to evaluate the integral of the product is actually multiplied while using STOs. So, in conclusion, I may quote one particular sentence from that famous paper. The smaller Gaussian representations seem suitable as universal atomic orbital basis functions, which may be used in molecular calculations instead of STO sets. In today's time, though, some ab initio packages are there like stop or smiles, which use slater type orbitals for calculations. But most of the packages prefer the Gaussian type orbitals. Now, just one little thing about the nomenclature of GTOs. But before that, tell me, what do you think? How many Gaussians are needed to represent a typical STO for a good enough approximation? Uh, please watch this video now and write your case in the comment box if you are seeing this video for the first time. I just actually want to see how synced are we as when I first learned about this. I thought for a good enough representation, we are going to need at least 20 GTOs or 50 or 100 would be better. But do you know the real number of GTOs? Often only 3 GTOs are more than sufficient. Now, if we represent 1 STO by 3 GTOs, then, in short, this sum is called STO 3G. Similarly, for N GTOs, it is called STO NG. Okay. Actually, there does come a point where the Gaussians become linearly dependent, and then adding more functions is not useful anymore. In fact, in that 1969 paper, they particularly said the STO 3G set in particular is very economical to use and as a minimal that is 1s, 2s and 2p basis can be applied to a quite large organic molecules. However, STO 6G is too greatly efficient that we really can rely upon and stop adding any more Gaussian to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. I believe that this lecture had been quite long enough, but also you have learned many things here, right? Okay, let's meet again in our next video. Thank you. Thanks a lot.